You're still on to the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Right now, we are going to look at the newspapers and see what the headlines are saying this morning. And joining us to talk uh, on these headlines is Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, my brother. Thanks okay. for having me. Happy New Year to you. Same to you. Mm. And I also wish our great Zihad a Happy New Year. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're beginning with the Guardian newspaper, and um, uh, the leading headline there is saying, despite 20 million out-of-school children, 29 states fail to access 68 billion naira universal basic education fund. Let's start with that and get your comments. Hey, honestly speaking, when I read that story, my heart started bleeding. Bleeding that we have money to improve the educational infrastructures in the primary school. And then the state will decline or will refuse to take advantage. What that tells me as a person is that these people are not interested in talking. Their priorities is somewhere else. They don't pay any premium to education. And uh, when you look around the world, you find out no nation can ever develop without massive, massive investment in education. But because maybe the returns uh, is nothing, will not be something meaningful to the different state government, they are not interested in annexing that fund. They collect that if I mean that deep. Okay, we have a little hitch there. Um, but now we are talking about 29 states failing to access 68 billion Naira Universal Basic Education Fund. And this fund is a grant that is given to states to upgrade their facilities in the schools, uh, primary schools especially, and the states are failing to access that, are failing to take advantage of that, possibly because uh, they are required to give 50% of this uh, amount that is supposed to be accessed uh, from uh, the source. So because of the 50%, maybe I'm just saying because they didn't come out, the states didn't come out to say categorically that this was the reason why they were not able to uh, or they refused to access the funds. 50%, if you're going to get 10 million naira, for instance, and you're expected to bring 5 million naira, and the other 5 million will be added onto you so that you can do what you need to do in the educational sector, and you refuse to do it? It's a question we're asking ourselves, even as the federal government has also uh, not done, not lived up to expectations. We are, we're expecting that this government will do better and give us more than the seven, the paltry 7% that they gave us for education in our budget. Uh, Tunde Kolawoli has rejoined us. Yes, uh, um, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, go yes. right ahead. We lost your audio at some point. Yeah. As I was saying, if you will remember, pictures and videos have been posted of children sitting under the tree for school mm. in places like Abuja, which ordinarily should be a role uh, for the in terms of uh, educational and social provision when compared to other states. Even in Mr. Wilkes River State, where there is a boat that all, all the infrastructure, all basic infrastructure have been provided in schools and some of these other places. We are seeing pictures of dilapidated schools where our children are schooling in those places. Then up north, Look at the number of out of school children. Look at the number of our children that are roaming the streets under the guise of the animal uh, uh, Islamic educational uh, activities. And with regard to that animal jiri, you ask, when have we ever seen children roaming the streets in Saudi Arabia, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Turkey, under the guise of religion? Honestly speaking, I think we must find a way to impose these responsibilities on the state government and the federal government when it comes to ensuring that we have adequate materials and resources 
and provisions for the children to be able to go to school. Not just go to school, go to a school where it's going to be very, very easy for both the teacher and the student to exchange ideas and learn new things. Are you still there, Tunde? That's my take on that. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, well, still talking about education. When we, we, we find out that education is not taken seriously here in Nigeria and uh, you want to move to other countries to go and get an education, right now we're seeing uh, something really scary. For me, it is scary where uh, stories coming from uh, Togo, uh, from Benin Republic and all that, that you can just walk in and walk out with a degree. It's, it's okay, so now federal government has... Um, uh, sacked uh, NSIP boss, has suspended certificates from Bene Togo universities and all that. All the uh, media houses are carrying uh, this story this morning about the suspension of those uh, uh, countries' uh, certificates that come into Nigeria. I'd like to get your comment on that. It's like uh, village people don't follow us, go township. <laughs> That's how it is. That is uh, I, I, I can see that uh, all our newspapers have run in headline mm. with regards to the sales and purchases of certificates yeah. from some of these uh, neighboring West African countries. For me, I think we are merely being hypocritical. Why do I say that? Not long ago, similar things were said about the university here in Lagos, where certificates have been sold and they're being bought in millions of naira. I also remember there's a polytechnic also in Lagos in here, in which it's been uh, uh, pointed out in the past that they also sell and um, buy certificates in that institution. This is for so many other uh, schools in Nigeria. So if we are doing this in Nigeria, why would we stay or expect that everything will be perfect uh, in this other country? And it is not just in Nigeria. There have been reports before of these things being done in people in places like Korea, South Korea, and some of these other countries of the world. It's not a new phenomenon. It has always been there. I remember when I was in a second school, we had a teacher who said the school somewhere and not up to PhD. But the quality of his teaching, I'm talking about 40 years ago. Mm. was a suspect. And when the students began to complain, and the principal and the education authorities were forced to do the investigation, it was found that this man was carrying a PhD in economic certificate from mm. the U.S. So, the responsibility is on the control authorities, the Federal Ministry of Education, the State Ministry of Education, to strengthen the control measures, the accreditation measures, and also the investigative measures, so that when somebody presents a certificate, we should, as it used to be in those days, ascertain, clarify, investigate in a very discreet manner whether these certificates are genuine or not. And with the cutting edge technologies that the people dispose of now, internet, Google, and what have you, TV, telephone conversations, and what have you, internet services, email services, it shouldn't be too difficult to verify statistics within uh, two, three uh, days. Let me also let our viewers know when people like us enter the university, especially in West of Ibadan, which has a very, very strong control measure, they will accept whatever statistics you bring, but behind your back, they will begin to investigate and your certificate. They will discreetly write to most of these places, visit some of these places, ask some of these schools <coughs> to forward to them the list of graduates who people get in that school and so, so, so years and all that. And most of them, they are, they are obliged. And with that, you may even be in your final year in the university, in the university of the bottom, and they discover that the result that you have submitted to access admission is a fake, and then they will just throw you out very quietly without uh, uh, any noise. 
But the truth of the matter is that when you read the report in the paper today, both the people selling the certificate, both the people buying, and both the people accepting those certificates are in the know as regards the transaction that has taken place in this place. So, we are merely trying or we try to remove the speck in somebody's eyes when we have laws and beams in our own eyes. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, well, um, like you said, these things also happen in Nigeria, and I don't know why, uh, what uh, the government will do about that. I, I don't know, uh, but just suspending certificates from these countries, uh, is that the right way to go? What else could they have done? Uh, because there may be some people who have certificates from these countries that genuinely went to school in those countries and spent the whole years that they needed to spend uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the universities. But now just to suspend them, it means everybody, that's a blanket uh, uh, solution for everybody, whether you're fake or not fake. Mm. Well, the, I think the right step is to first suspend. And then when you have suspended, the suspension is not going to affect those who have earlier, earlier on submitted certificates from those places and all that. It is the new people that are bringing those certificates that will not be accepted, to be accredited or to be accepted. So for those who have submitted in the past, I am sure what the federal government will do, what the state government will do, is to now begin a discrete investigation of the certificate they have taken from some of these places in the past, and then find out or ascertain whether they are genuine or not. So if in the future they are able to stumble on the fact that those certificates are equally fake, then of course they will take appropriate criminal minimum steps. Mm. Buying and selling of certificates is a very, very serious matter. It's a criminal offense, and I'm sure uh, the federal government and the state government will handle it both as a civil and a criminal matter. Okay, um, let's move to another, another uh, headline, still on the Guardian newspaper. Federal government directs MDAs to re remit 100% of generated revenue. Will this help us or will it not? Hello, yeah. Whatever, whatever revenues MDAs generate, the federal government is asking them to remit 100% of it to the federal coffers. Is this a good thing or yeah. a bad thing for our economy? Ordinarily, that is what should be done. A revenue generating agency can also not begin or start to appropriate such a revenue that has generated without some control measures being put somewhere. Let's say, for example, the Joint and Admission Matriculation Board, that is JAM. Mm. Uh, that organization has shown the capacity to really generate a lot of funds. And what they, I suspect they do now, after they have generated the funds, taking what they want to take, they return the remaining or the balance to the federal government, to the corpus of the federal government. That is not the way it should be done. What all organizations, whether at the state level, at the local government level, at the federal level, ordinarily should do whatever revenue they are generating, they will send to the coffers of the federation. And then on a yearly basis, they will also make a budget of how much they will require to spend, both on recurrent and capital expenditure. And once the National Assembly approves this, or pass into law, then the Akata General and all the respective agencies will be remitting that budget to them to be able to meet whatever recurrent and the capital expenditures that uh, they have said they will do within the year. And not for them to make the to, to generate the revenue and begin to spend it without some accountability somewhere. And of course, there is a budget which is been made for them, uh, which uh, you will find it difficult to implement or to control or to monitor if they are the one generating and also expanding. Part of the problem we have in this country, like some of us have always said, is that um, the monitoring, the control with regards to funds that are generated 
cannot have been properly composed. And uh, that goes across all the MDAs. It should stop. I am sure if it stops, some of the leakages that we have seen in some of these places will be drastically reduced, if not totally eliminated. Mm. Okay, um, a final one from The Guardian before we move on to another newspaper is uh, Southern Middle Belt leaders petition Tinubu on restructuring. Uh, I agree. Honestly speaking, anybody who loves this country, I want to see or hopes and pray that it remains one will encourage the present government to engage in some restructuring. When we say restructuring, or when we propose restructuring, no, we are not talking about confederation. We are not also hoping that we break the country into tiny systems or states that will neither be here nor there. What we are saying is that the fundamentals of federation should be institutionalized. So there are some of the challenges that this um, uh, unity system of government that are running have thrown up will be reduced, if not totally eliminated. For example, we are talking about state police. For example, we are talking about the freedom of uh, religion. We are talking about allowing the state to have a court of appeal and the Supreme Court. We are also talking about the state having control over their mineral resources over their water, over whatever is within the boundaries of their respective states, and then pay royalties and um, taxes to the federal government for external affairs and management, and then also for the running of the army and all that, all the those things that are central to all the states. We also want to look at the situation. In which salaries and civil servants and in legal state will be different from what uh, the civil servants in Jigawa and Sokoto State, for example, will be earning. Because of the cost of living in legal state is way, way higher than the cost of living in places like Jigawa, San Fara, and Sokoto State. So all these minimum wage that people talk about will also be affected by the structure. All these um, state assemblies uh, assemblies and local government earning the same salaries and allowances being the thing of the past. For example, a state like a city state that's very, very poor will say no. Our assembly members will only take a sitting allowances. We're not going to be providing accommodation for them. We're not going to be buying cars for them. And what have you. So those are the kind of um, uh, restructuring that we are talking about. If we have such restructuring, and a, a lot of responsibilities are placed on the soldiers of the local government, on the soldiers of the state government, with regards to security, I am sure the security challenge that we have in the country today will be minimized or reduced. It is not that it's going to be totally eliminated, because what is causing security in some of these places is the hunger for land, the fight for land between the farmers and the others. What is also causing the insecurity is the enormous uh, mineral resources potential that certain cappers, that certain warlords want to seize the land in which they are embedded and begin to take away those uh, solid mineral resources without paying revenue or anything to the federal government. Uh, as you have heard in the past, they did believe and come back the need for restructuring. Before he was one of the persons that started it, when he created uh, additional local governments uh, in legal states and all that, among other landmark uh, achievements. So, whether we have the courage to step on the toes of some powerful people who are opposed to restructuring of this country is a different thing entirely. Because when it is easier when you are outside when you are not the one in the shadow, to begin to mass and combat this thing. But when you get in there, you find out that the issues are very complex, that a lot of landmines will be laid, if not already laid for you. 
and all that. So it's about political courage. It is about a man who will not care about whether he gets a second term or not. But if Ashwati is thinking about a second term, I doubt it whether he will be able to engage in meaningful restructuring of the country. Wow. So it depends on the ambition of one man at the end of the day. Okay. Um, we're moving to the Punch newspaper, and the leading headline is NNPCL marketers clash over subsidy. Operators peg petrol at 1,200 naira per liter. The writers are saying marketers oppose federal government on subsidy. NNPCL says fuel importation costs now fully recovered. Uh, dealers insist on 1,200 naira per liter fuel and 112 oil theft cases recorded in one week. 1,200 uh, naira per liter. Can we survive it? Anytime we're talking about <laughs> the, the fuel going so high, they bring uh, statistics from other countries how they pay for a liter of fuel. Uh, some countries are paying 1,500 naira, some are 2,000, some are 1,000 and all that. And I keep asking myself if the minimum wage is the same in those countries, if the per capita income <laughs> is the same in those countries. And I, I don't know, can we survive 1,200 naira per liter? Well, it is going to be difficult. But let me begin to say that it's unfortunate that those who sold the government to us, that with the total deregulation of the activities in the petroleum sector, this subsidy issue is in a thing of the past. And now the one again can back him, that the subsidy has not been totally removed. In fact, I was watching on television, and I read something that uh, the economist, Mr. Arewane, mm. of financial derivatives, yes. published um, last week on this first subsidy thing. Yeah. Some of the things they have said could be said to be true. Others, neither here nor there. Why do I say that? Because I do know that people lie, or sometimes lie, with statistics. You yourself have said something that is very, very fundamental this uh, uh, morning. That is the minimum wage and value of currencies. The same in some of the countries that have been mentioned when compared to Nigeria. The answer is no. So, but the challenge we are having in this country, and what those who sold the dummy to us, that wants to deregulate, wants to remove the subsidy in those places, didn't tell us is that uh, you will require to have a stable exchange rate for you to be able to maintain a standard or a status or a unique or a regime of oil prices or a oil prices that will not be changeable, that will not change. If your dollar or if your naira or your currency is at the mercy of the dollar, in which petroleum products are given, uh, petroleum products are denominated. There will never be a stable price of petroleum resources in that kind of a country. So and you and I know the bulk of the fuel that we consume in this country are still imported from abroad uh, and they are denominated in Naira. And the value of our own currency is sliding on a daily basis, whereas the dollar has remained uh, stable. So, how do you bridge this gap? That is the, 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 the million dollar uh, question. And uh, you will need to be self-sustaining in terms of production of petroleum products at home. And if you are self-sustaining, there's still going to be another challenge in that area. And what is the challenge? So long as you are selling the crude oil to the refineries in Nigeria, at the international market rate and in dollars, they will also not be able to guarantee a stable uh, petroleum product prices in Nigeria. It is the rate at which they buy in the international market and the cost of uh, producing and distribution in the country that will determine how much they will also sell locally, even when they are producing it locally. It's a very, very complex issue, and that is the reason why the federal government should have been more circumspect in removing or in doing a wholesale removal of the so-called subsidy that is said to be on the petroleum products 
Nigeria. Okay, um, let's go to COVID-19. Uh, beneficiaries protest as banks begin COVID-19 loan recovery. They got some loans, COVID-19 loans, maybe to aid their businesses and so many other things. And now the recovery process is bringing protest uh, from those who benefited from it. <laughs> what are your comments? When it just tells you that our attitude to paying loans or paying debt is a zero. Most of the people that access those loans and more than access it not because they have the intention to pay back. In fact, I can remember some of my acquaintances nudging me, encouraging me to go for the loan. They see it as a kind of a booty. They own share of the national case, which is not going to be repaid back. And unfortunately, too, there were no stringent controls or measures put on ground for the recovery of some of the, I mean, of these COVID uh, loans. You were merely directed to a website to apply for the loan and provide some data to back it up. And I can remember. When somebody encouraged me to apply for it, he said um, the website is always damped during the day. But I should try to access the website between 12 midnight and uh, 5 a.m. Uh, in the morning, uh, which I didn't do. Now, some of those who access this loan may have provided uh, wrong data, uh, wrong statistics, or information that will make it difficult for the government or for the bank to be able to trace them. Yes, they could have the NIM. Yes, they could have BGM. But if they have some of this information and all that, and they have relocated abroad, how will you be able to recover the loans from them? Because some of them use this loan to store up the funds that they wanted to use to relocate abroad. So it's a very, very complex thing. I recollect that uh, in the past, we used to have a student loan board that gave loans to so many Nigerians to study in those days. And I'm speaking to you, less than 10% of such loans have been recovered. Most of those who access the loans disappear into thin air and they're never found till today. And it's not peculiar to Nigeria alone. I remember somebody getting a loan from um, the UK I relocated to Nigeria and refused to pay. The British government, all the school, and all the institutions that gave him a loan in the UK, had to hire a lawyer in Nigeria and get a security people to trace this person. And after they traced him and got him, they hired a lawyer to prosecute him in a Nigerian court to recover uh, the loan. So if you have thousands of millions of people, who have done similar things, are you going to hire million security men to trace or trail them or sort them out and also millions of lawyers to fight petitions in court to recover the loan? As far as I'm concerned, the federal government may be having a very, very bad loan in his hands and you don't use good money to chase a bad debt. Daily Trust. Um, uh, we're starting with a smaller headline. National Assembly's budget of 344.4 billion naira is higher than 15 federal universities. Uh, that's uh, one of the headlines there uh, at the top of that newspaper. What are your comments? 15 federal <coughs> universities do not have a budget that is equal to <laughs> <laughs> the budget of the National Assembly of people who are less than 500, or at least less than 1,000. Uh, they have 344.4 billion naira. What are your thoughts? My, my, my brother, this is one of my fears for the represent government, for what you want to the Nubusa presidency. Since he came into power, the running of the country is being done in the ways and manner his predecessors have also done it. 
and which we have done things in the past, which didn't work for us, why will we continue to check the same path? In the return to this civil rule, when the executive arm of government has taken a budget proposal to the National Assembly, the National Assembly has always found ways and means to increase those uh, budget proposals. Not with few millions of naira, not with few uh, thousands, not with few uh, billions, but a multi of trillions of naira, for God's sake. We are talking about the uh, excessive cost of governance. We are talking about excessive uh, uh, prices of uh, contracts and services in Nigeria. We are talking about wastages in all the different uh, segments of the of uh, uh, governance. One would have expected that the budget proposal that was taken to the National Assembly would even be further reduced by the National Assembly in a way in which we are just cutting our clothes according to the size of our clothes. Because when you look at that budget critically, a large chunk of it is going to be financed with borrowing from different parts of the country, I mean internally and externally. So why will you be borrowing money? Or why will you be anticipating borrowers and predicating your uh, uh, budget estimate for the year on money that you are going to be borrowing from certain places? It means that if you don't get that money to borrow, the federal government will go back to what it has always been doing, ways and means. That is asking the CBN to begin to print money, which they will be spending without any backup. That would lead to high inflation, will lead to more corruption, and if care is not taken, a breakdown of law and order, because the people are already getting pushed to the wall. And by the time their back hits the wall, they will begin to kick back. They will begin to fight back. The National Assembly are showing selfishness. They are not demonstrating that they are patriots. They are not demonstrating that they know where the shoes are thinking. We are the ordinary Nigerians. And look at what they did. Maybe they got in there. They bought salt, utility vehicle for themselves. What billions of naira? And then last December, the Senate president said some certain things have been sent to senators are can for their enjoyment, for their holiday enjoyment, yeah. for their vacation. For God's sake, if the ordinary man in the, on the street is the asked to tighten the seat belt, the belt in the waist of the National Assembly people, the belt in the waist of uh, Houses of assembly people in all the different states should be the one to be called tightened before they begin to call on the ordinary Nigerians to also guard their way. I'm, I'm sorry to say we are not ready to move the nation forward. If okay. this is the way and manner the National Assembly will be behaving. Okay, well, um, we are still hopeful 2024 will be good. Let me join these two headlines together on, st on the Daily Trust. Uh, identify, okay, not central governors to federal government. Identify root causes of plot two killings for lasting peace. NBA decries intelligence, failure, asks Tinubu to prioritize security. Those are the riders. Pandev, Afeniferre, Ohaneze, NBF, seek end to killings in the north. 19 vigilantes, several bandits killed in Kaduna two gunned down as Boko Haram attacks Chibok. Okay, the second headline I'm adding there is Tudumbiri, one month after residents await compensation outcome of committee report. Remember that when these plateau killings uh, took yeah. place, they, f the president said or directed that uh, compensation, or not even compensation, that palliatives and uh, uh, some other things should be given to these people who have lost um, loved ones, lost farmlands, and lost a lot of other things. And now we're talking about Tudumbiri, where the army bombed the people and killed over 100 people, and they were asked to compensate them till date. Nobody has heard the mm. report of the committee set uh, for that purpose, and nobody has been given compensation. And 
just what are your thoughts? It has happened in Plateau, it has happened in Tudunbiri, it has happened in Kaduna, it has happened everywhere. And if we're talking compensation that will never arrive, what are we even talking well, about? Well, let, let, let me say that uh, I don't know, I am not too sure, whether the committee set up to investigate Pasatin what happened in Tudunbiri had submitted its, uh, its uh, report. One month later. Is the committee, is that? One month is later, is it, not, is it not too, too long even for... Well, people have died already. It, it people is. are grieving already. It is. It is. Ordinarily, compensation of student, uh, the people of uh, student building should have been in three phases. The first one would have been immediately that it didn't happen. The nation's emergency relief agency should have moved in there to provide certain basis to come for the people. And then when that has been done, and the committee is reaching, I mean, it's a teaching, and compiling their reports, collecting the names of people that are affected, the property that has been damaged and all that, then, when the submit is report, the findings of the report will be the basic, the, the basis of compensation to the people of Tudum Billy from the federal government. So before this happens, there is nothing stopping the local government where this happened, the National Emergency Relief Agency, and the state government providing certain basic relief to the people before the federal government gets hold of uh, the report or whatever committee it might have, um, have been set up and all that. But uh, just like we are uh, doing now, raising anxiety whether at the end of the day this matter will not be shut under the carpet. It is not impossible. We have had the state government, we have had the local government, the federal government talking about compensation. In the last 12 or 15 years or thereabouts, since we have been having the Boko Haram insurgency, and then nothing has happened. It's only the governors in Borono State that one can say have uh, risen to the challenge of rehabilitating their people, of resettling them. Not much has happened in the other parts of the country. Remember there was a time that some bandits went to attack a war in which almost about 40 people were killed. I'm not too sure that the people affected by that, uh, by the killings in the war have been fully rehabilitated. We cry when these things happen and immediately the, 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 the dogs begin to settle. The matters are set under the carpet. But I suspect that this is not impossible. Uh, and it has been my fear for the federal government, especially for Asuaji Bola and Tinobu, that no matter what good intentions you may be having, no matter what good intentions you may be having, resources, money, funds are likely to be an impediment to most of the things that you want to do. We have said it this morning. Our ability to sell petroleum products in the international market is being hampered, not just by the activities of uh, fire pipeline vendors and what have you, but also the quantity that we are selling. We also know that um, the world is now investing in cleaner energy. So the demand for petroleum products internationally we continue to go down. So if your economy is predicated on selling crude oil and international market, you will be at the vagary of the frontation that will always happen in the international oil market. So, as good uh, as the intention might be to begin to compensate, rehabilitate these people, where the funding will come from will most likely be a challenge for both the federal government, the state government, the local government. We've eaten our cake before baking it. What miracles we'll be doing to get the cake back is seem to be in the hand of God and politicians okay. who have conscience, who want to do things out of the box mm. and not the way we've been doing it since 1999. All right. 
Uh, well, we'll keep praying uh, to God, and then we'll tell God, please give conscience to our politicians so that tomorrow Amen. we will know that uh, our Nigeria will grow from strength to strength. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Tunde Kola Wole, for coming Amen. on the program this morning. It's been a marathon, for and we're, we're glad that you could give us this time. Thank you so much. I wish you a lovely day. You too, you too. Thank you. No. Mm. We've been talking with Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos. We were reviewing the headlines this morning. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll take our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>